How's the royal family? I pray that everyone is doing well. Well, my royal family, I said I'll take another direction and present something um, that some may know and some may not. And I knew a little bit about what I'm going to present, but when I um, dug in it, into it much deeper and did, like I usually do research, it was it was quite touching what I'm going to present to the royal family. And then it, it's sad, too, in the end, too, as well. So y'all see the title I have there, and I just love that they called this place Black Eaton. So let me read a little bit here for y'all. Today, glory days of Idlewild feel a bit like fever dream. Just ask any of the African-American vacationers who made the pilgrimage to the Michigan resort, resort from the 1910s um, to the 60s. It was something that you would never believe, stranger than fiction, ref, um, reflects one, one woman in um, Coy Davis Jr.'s um, documentary, Whatever Happened to Idlewild? In the midst of Jim Crow segregation, Idlewild became so much more than just a summer retreat for the affluent black community. It was a garden of Eden. And I'll share these various pictures um, later. I'm gonna take the royal family on a journey. So let's start here. Idlewild, past and present. Thank you for watching My News 26. I'm Paula Jasper. Today we're in Idlewild, and joining me is John Meeks, a long-term resident. Thanks for joining me, John. Yes, I'm John Meeks, and I've uh, been in Idlewild, uh, been connected with Idlewild since uh, 1954. And uh, that was my first uh, experience of, uh, of visiting uh, historical Idlewild. And, uh, those were the days when Idlewild was at, at its peak in being a famous entertainment center of, of the Midwest. Uh, they had uh, three nightclubs here at one time, had, had live entertainment, uh, and there were thousands and thousands of people would converge on here every weekend. The place would just be live with people. Uh, the, my first experience on the beach was there were people there on the beach wall to wall. It wasn't hardly even walking space there. And, and at that time, they had uh, eight uh, uh, policemen, and their duties was to do nothing but handle traffic, make sure that no one blocked the movement of traffic. Basically, there was no crime for them to deal with, so it was strictly uh, traffic patrol that they was working on. Now, what year was that? Uh, this was in 1954. And 1954 probably was the peak of the, uh, you know, the entertainment part of Idlewild. Well, who were some of the performers that you saw here? Uh, some of the performers here that come to mind would be the Four Tops, Sarah Vaughn, uh, George Kirby, uh, Jackie Wilson. Uh, the list goes on and on. A lot of the body, the list goes on and on. Now, was it that busy year-round here? Uh, the Idlewild was strictly seasonal. Uh, it opened up uh, May, uh, May 30th, and, and it closed down uh, at Labor Day. And at the end of the season, they had uh, the nightclubs would have what they called Bear in the Show. That was the last show for the season. And there'd always be sellout crowds for the, for the final show of the season. Now, people came from all over to come here then? People came from all over the country. To, here to, to Idaho. A uh, matter of fact, uh, we have residents here for basically from almost every state in the Union, from, from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast. Now, were there grocery stores, post office? Oh, there, there, uh, Idaho was a very uh, commercialized then. We had, uh, at that time, probably 30 some motels, uh, probably about 10 or 15 restaurants, uh, three nightclubs. 
Uh, it was a, in the service stations, grocery stores. We had all of the services that, you know, the tourists would uh, need. The services was provided for them. Okay, now Baldwin is so close by. Was Baldwin a lot smaller then? Baldwin uh, is just about uh, five minutes from here, and Baldwin was always been closely connected with Idlewild. It's almost a, a spillover into Baldwin. Now, when did Idlewild really begin? Idlewild began in uh, 1912, and uh, the growth period of uh, Idlewild was uh, in the 20s uh, is when it uh, made the most progress. That's when uh, the individuals moved from living in tents to, to small places called dog houses, was just big enough for sleeping, and then uh, in the mid-20s they started building uh, year-round homes here then, and since that time it's been... Uh, accumulation of, uh, of uh, nice homes, especially around the lake. Now, why did it begin here? You said Louis Armstrong? Yeah, well, uh, back uh, in, in the peak of the, the entertainment part of Idlewild, uh, uh, it goes all the way back as uh, far as uh, 1927 there. There were pictures here of Louis Armstrong fishing out here on, uh, on uh, Idlewild Lake, and uh, uh, his wife, uh, Lil Armstrong, was living here when she passed. What was it like to come here during its heyday? Uh, coming to Idlewild uh, was uh, basically for entertainment. Uh, it was a good time. Idlewild was basically a party place. It was a place people come to just have fun, party. Uh, partying on, on Idlewild on weekends was, was uh, 24 hours a day, all day and all night parties. You'd go, you'd go to bed, get some rest, and get up and start back partying again. And it, was, and it was all about just having fun and meeting people. You met people here from all over the world. This is fascinating. Thanks for joining me, John. Thank you, and you're welcome. Wow. Paula Jasper, Minus 26, and Idlewild. Okay, my royal family, we just going to keep rolling with it. idea of turning it into a black resort because the blacks had nowhere to go. The branches were very religious people, very religious. You probably know that. Uh, and so they went to Baldwin and said, we have this idea. What would you think of inviting the blacks to have a resort here? And they okayed it. My family first came to Ottawa in 1932. At that time, my father was uh, the first black state senator in Michigan. And uh, we came up here, as soon as school was out, we'd come up here in the summertime. And uh, we would stay three months and then go back to school in Detroit. Well, it was publicized in the Chicago Defender uh, by Leela Wilson, one of the founders of Idlewild that if you would come to Idlewild, she would give you a lot. And uh, a lot of people, migrated, mostly, they migrated from Chicago more than any other. And uh, when they got up here, they found out it wasn't farmland, it was mostly sand. A lot of them went back, some of them did stay. That's when the resort started. And that's when uh, Mr. Branch and his brothers came in and started plotting out lots. And lots were sold too by him. 
learned it from interviewing people, that Woodland Park was first founded by a man named Marion Arthur and his wife, Ella. And they both have been instrumental um, or working with the Idaho Resort Company in Idaho. And they have been, he in fact had been a salesman for them, had been one of their chief salesmen, as, as I understood. And that um, as the property in Idaho was becoming scarce, that Mr. Arthur went looking for property that he could emulate Idaho, and that's when he founded Woodland Park. There was a lady by the name of um, Dorsey that um, I don't know if my folks knew this lady personally or my mother just happened to meet her somewhere, but she was telling her, my mother, that uh, they, about the summer resort in Woodland Park that catered more or less to black people. And at that time, it was rather unusual cause, because there aren't too many places for black people to go. And um, when my mother told my dad about it, he was so excited that there were there was some place really that they could go and and um, relax and vacation like you know, other people did. So uh, they made plans to come to Wilton Park. We had little booklets like this with pictures of the hotel and all that they used for publicity had postcards that they used to send out giving the rates at the hotel. One thing that um, I have learned is that um, Ella Arthur was a master at marketing. Um, that any time, and you've seen any of the pictures that we have, most of these pictures were actually um, postcards. And what she would do is anytime somebody caught a big fish, anytime somebody built a house, anytime somebody did something monumental, Mrs. Arthur would take a picture of him and have it made into a postcard. So then when that person sent the postcard, or when anybody who came uh, bought the postcard or got the postcard and sent it across the country, then other African Americans saw what these African Americans were doing in northern Michigan. And that's what created the whole fervor. Uh, if you look at some of the other the things, I mean, even today, when I look at, at some of these things that, uh, these advertisements that um, that we have gotten, most of them are prior to 1940. Um, it makes you proud to think that, uh, you know, the way that they, they knew how to market. And it, again, like I mentioned before, they used catchy phrases. They knew how to, how to touch the, the hearts or the, the feelings that were generated through, through the uh, Negro communities then. You know, own your own land, be your own landlord, own something that nobody can take away from you. Those are the, that they, uh, they captured the, 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 the feeling that was happening um, in, in our communities. And My grandfather, Charles W. Chestnut, had a court reporting agency in Cleveland, Ohio. And since the courts were not in operation in the summer, he was free to travel and come up here. My grandmother liked it up here very much. And uh, that, I think, was an incentive for him to build. This was basic on the area at that particular time wasn't attractive to whites. There were other areas in the um, uh, further north, uh, 70 or 80 miles in the, uh, in the Traverse City area that uh, where that you had uh, uh, Places that individuals, um, industrialists, and, and uh, people who was coming in from Chicago and various places, they were they were building and settling there. No matter where you lived in the park, that's what we call Woodland Park, the park. No matter where you lived in the park, if you were a teenager, you headed for the porch on the Royal Breeze Hotel, and and all the youngsters. I could remember my children saying the same thing to me. If it, a flashlight was was necessary, because all the kids traverse the roads at night, walking with their lights, and you could be looking, and you would see just lights bobbing up and down the road, and it would be a bunch of kids going home at night from from having been to the hotel. The island across the lake was the center of Idlewild. Wild and it was built up, now it's not, 
uh, on that island there was the clubhouse, which was a large structure at this end, at the east end, and um, they served meals there, and they would have music and dancing and uh, public meetings and things. It was a gathering place. But also on the island, there was a store which, which also included a, a gas station. There was one pump, and they had groceries and ice, and the post office, the summer post office, was also included in there. It was run by a family named Elsner. And uh, there was also, in the middle of the island, a barber shop for the summer run by a man named Day, D-A-Y. And there, at the other end of the island, at the west end of the island, there was a three-story hotel. I don't know how many rooms it had in it, but they were single rooms for visitors. And uh, then, on the back side of the island, there were individual small uh, cabins, which people, tourists, visitors could also rent um, if they didn't want to stay in the hotel. And then also at the west end of the island was a, what, a nightclub called the Purple Palace. And, uh, all of these things were in full swing during the summer, say, and people would gather there the weekends, the nightclub would do best on the weekend, and, uh, you know, people would row across the lake. In the 20s, there were not a great many cars. People walked, and you would walk around on the road with your flashlight and to do or attend something on the island, and then you would walk back. Somewhere around probably the late 20s, the early 30s, uh, Maddie Keller and uh, Ella Towns came to Wyndham Pond. And um, as I'm enamored with M Mayor and Arthur and his wife Ella, I'm also enamored with them. They were two sisters and um, who, as I have been told, came from um, all the way from uh, uh, the south in a taxi. And um, but the minute that they came here to Woodland Park, and the rumor has it that they brought a suitcase full of money, and they probably did, because it seems like from the day, well, you know, when you look back from here, looking back, things seem to happen so fast. But when, um, when I think about the things that they did, they, they built the first store in Woodland Park. It was, uh, they called it the Woodland Park Coffee Shop and, and Oil Station. And then on the same corner as our store today, the, the, I don't know how long they kept it, but then they, they expanded that into a, uh, a store, a grocery store. Then they um, expanded even that. They also built the one of the maybe second or third hotels here, very elegant, uh, uh, in the huge building, and humongous building um, that they called the Kelsonia Inn, excuse me, the Kelsonia Ranch. And I understand they had dances there. And for some reason, um, they decided that they didn't want it there anymore, that there was some property that was close to the lake. And they had that building torn down and the lumber they used to build the building that's still standing today called the Kelsonia Inn. Well, I remember coming to Idlewild to see the Heidi Heidi Hole Man in about 1942. And my next trip was uh, to see Dinah Washington at uh, Paradise Club. The, the wonderful entertainers, the, the entertainment, I, I didn't think of it as living here or anything. I just, it was something so different to, uh, you know, that it, the only chance I'd ever have to see the big entertainers was to come here. I think they had choices. I don't know if you'd say it's outgrowing a place. You just have so many other choices. And it's just like we are today. You might go, you might decide, you know, you might be able to afford to go to Hawaii every year, but then you might learn, well, I think maybe I might want to go to the Caribbean. I have a choice, you know, Hawaii is beautiful, but 
I think I'll choose to go to the Caribbean this year. You know, I think it's it's very much the same. It wasn't about it at that time, yeah. But we weren't foresighted. We weren't for we never thought the day would come along when integration would be gone. They sent men up here from Detroit Free Press, Detroit Times, interviewing me. What happened, Sonny? I said, integration. They jumped. Integration's beautiful. I said, yeah, not for black men this. And they didn't leave us because it was black or white. They black that because we weren't competitive. 1970, I can remember just as clear as I fell. The bottom fell out, just like, boom, it's all over. My business dropped half. It shows one of the things that we had to struggle so hard for, just like struggling to get to sit on the bus in the right place. It, we had to struggle for Idlewild because we couldn't go anyplace else. It's one of our accomplishments. So it, it's a place where you feel comfortable, where you, the neighbors that you've gotten to know are like members of your own family, and that people would say at the end of the summer, God willing, we'll see you again next year. If you're tired of the city's toil and strife, pack your grip, take children and wife. Hop a train that's bound for the royal breeze, just a place to rest, the crowd agrees. Here you meet your friends far and near, joy and laughter brighten days most drear. Not a chance to mope over moments sad, come to, come to Woodland Park and be made glad. Glad that life is coursing your veins, glad you found a place where God reigns. Glad that there's hope and faith among your race, glad to meet your brother face to face. All right, my royal family, shut this down. And um, I forgot to tell y'all, I do have a bonus um, video where we're going to listen to an audio. Then I'll bring up that bonus video. I just want to keep rolling with it. Now, I found something on NPR about um, Black Eaton, the town that um, segregation built. And this was done July 5th, 2012. A moment of America's racial history happened in an unlikely place, a little town called Idlewild, also called America's Black Eden. While activists fought for civil rights in cities like Montgomery and Little Rock, the resort in West Central Michigan was one of the few where African Americans could vacation and purchase property, and it was hugely popular. This summer, Idlewild is celebrating its centennial and its place in American history. From member station WCMU, Amy Robinson reports. Idlewild, Michigan is about 30 miles east of the larger resort city of Ludington, tucked away in the woods of the Huron-Manistee National Forest. People like Needy Windham remember this town as the go-to spot in the 50s and 60s for summer vacations. And uh, everybody said, you're going up north? Yep, we're going up north, we're going to Idlewild. What Windham didn't know when she came here as a child was that this resort was unlike any other in the United States. It was, in essence, the town that segregation built. Idlewild is invisible to most Americans, in fact, to most Michiganders. But in the 50s and 60s, it's just what working class African Americans were looking for. A reasonable driving distance from places like Chicago, St. Louis, of course Detroit, and yet, well, invisible. So African Americans could retreat from the ugliness of discrimination and Jim Crow. This is where black people could come and not have to worry about not being served and not being allowed to use the hotel or the motel or the facilities. Maxine Martin is a longtime Idlewilder. Her great-grandchildren are sixth generation here. We met up at the opening ceremonies for Idlewild Centennial. Martin remembers coming here in the town's heyday. That's when as many as 25,000 people swamped the town in the summer. The little resort attracted big names. B.B. King, Della Reese, Louis Armstrong, and Aretha. It was, for all intents and purposes, a boom town. There were nightclubs, after hours joints, hotels, motels, beauty shops, barber shops, restaurants, all over the place. Times change. Now, instead of hearing Aretha live, a DJ plays the Cupid Shuffle at Idlewild Centennial Kickoff. Hey, 
White speculators created Idlewild out of thousands of acres of prime forest land purchased before the National Forest was established. Their plan was to market it far and wide to African Americans looking for a resort. It worked so well, Idlewild became a resort unmatched in American history. In the end, it was integration that killed Idlewild. African Americans no longer had to remain invisible. Today, the community has a meager population of only 700 and a story to tell. My opinion is that Idlewild, Michigan is a major American historic resource. Everett Fly is an architect and historic preservationist who lives in San Antonio. He says Idlewild was the largest historic African-American resort in the continental U.S. Nearly 3,000 acres, 10 times the size of its contemporaries. It was home to playwrights, musicians, and intellectuals. I think there's a place for Idlewild as, if you will, a kind of a crucible, a place where ideas do come together. Now residents of Idlewild are looking for new ways to market their town's history and once again become a vacation destination. For NPR News, I'm Amy Robinson. Well, my royal family, as we continue on, let me bring up this bonus video that I forgot to pull up that I want to share. Let's see here. Let's get this going. Okay. Here it is. This video will speak for itself. Let's see here. I have to refresh this. It was already shedding light on the adversities that African Americans faced during the restrictive era of segregation and Jim Crow. In Maryland, beaches like Ocean City and Sandy Point were for whites only. But a set of African American sisters turned beachfront land in an app book won big at last night's Oscar, scoring best picture. But before it was big, it was already shedding light on the adversities that African Americans faced during the restrictive era of segregation and Jim Crow. In Maryland, beaches like Ocean City and Sandy Point were for whites only. But a set of African American sisters turned beachfront land in Annapolis into more than just a listing in the Green Book, which was a real thing. They made it a safe retreat for black Americans to thrive. growing up, Ocean City was segregated. I remember being in the water and there was a rope there with balls on it and you knew that you couldn't go beyond the rope because on the other side of the rope was the white area. And it was just something about whether it's the water fountains, the beach, the playgrounds, the libraries, the schools, there's something very uh, humiliating about seeing the white only sign or the colored only sign. I was probably eight years old. Um, I didn't know that I couldn't go to these other places. There was a recent movie called The Green Book that kind of outlined a lot of these different facilities where it was safe for people of color to go. Well, Cars and Sparrows Beach were one of those places. Here was the 1930s. You had two African-American females that owned acreage on the Chesapeake Bay. It was a source of confidence and empowerment. It's history that many of our people haven't seen. To see African Americans prevailing against all odds, uh, being educated, business people, hiring people, uh, adding to the tax rolls. They hired many of the local school teachers during this period of segregation where colored teachers were paid less than white teachers. Cause Beach was not a confined environment, but it had the, the air of a festival. So people felt free. The slogan was uh, Black Feet and White Sand. I mean, that was just so empowering. And no one could tell you to sit down or stand up. You could just come out and enjoy the Chesapeake Bay, enjoy the music, enjoy the food, enjoy the fellowship. Some of the entertainers that came to Cars Beach at that time were like Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Chick Webb, Duke Ellington, Bray Charles, James Brown, Sarah Vaughn. Just to see people of color in charge 
running something was just very empowering to a downtrodden people. I do feel a little sad that some of these beaches no longer exist, and I understand um, why, because when integration came, we decided to test all the things that we couldn't go to. They played such an important role, and as long as we don't forget that they existed, we've had some hard times, but we are survivors. Even with all of those obstacles, as a community, African Americans found ways to prevail, how to strive, how to empower others, how to maximize opportunity. And so I think that message is just as relevant today as it was in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. All right, my royal family, let me shut that completely down. And let me refresh this real quick. Let me see if we have it here. Let me see, see, see. Oh, let me uh, pull it up. <clears throat> let me take him off of there. Let's go back over to these pictures. Now, the video that I just showed um, the royal family, that was done February 25th, 2019, and they were talking about remembering Chesapeake Bay, exclusively African-American beaches. And... There were um, some sisters by the name of Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, and um, their father had purchased more than 100 acres. So these two sisters, um, one of the beaches was called um, Cars and Sparrow Beaches, uh, and they were listed in the, um, in the Green Book, which is outlined from different places where it was safe for African Americans to go to. And um, that was the bonus that I wanted to, to add, that th there was two beaches that were owned by black women um, and everything. And we can see the, the result of integration, um, how it affected us economically, because that's the thing that kept resounding in my psyche when I'm watching these videos and doing the research where we we have been as i speak and still remain segregated i have no problem with segregation i'm not interested in integrating even now i try to segregate myself as much as possible i know it's not easy but i'm not interested in um being around the enemy um even when i seek to come on YouTube, it was not, it was hard to find my family, even on YouTube. They bury us. They bury us. And um, I just thought, I'll do this um, video. Um, go over to uh, Phil's channel. He goes deeper into, and if I can remember, I'll put the link. He goes deeper into these, um, these beaches that were owned by these powerful sisters. And I said, well, I would focus more on Black Eaton, Idlewild. Remember that movie, Idlewild? That was a pretty good um, movie. But um, I just wanted to take it to a different direction. So my royal family, render your voice with your beautiful divine words. And as always, my royal family, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your support. And with that said, Ashe.